So I'm Yvonne. Um, this is me in various places. So I'm a release engineer at Chef, and we are hiring, so I always have to put that pitch in there. Um, for those of you who don't know, a release engineer is somebody who works mostly on internal tooling and packaging and publishing of packages out to the world. So that's kind of what we do. Um, Toolsmith, other, there are other names for it. Um, for the purposes of this talk, which is about getting started in open source, um, I'm currently a contributor or maintainer um, for a bunch of stuff in the Chef ecosystem. Omnibus Bento, Artifactory Jenkins, stuff like that. I'm also um, a contributor and maintainer for a project called Git for Knitters, which is um, just this little side thing that started between me and Emma Jane Westby, who is writing a book on Git for Teams, when we had this long Twitter conversation about how Git is really a lot like knitting. And so it's like, this is great. We should put this someplace more permanent. So that's what that is. Um, contribute if you're a knitter and you use Git. Um, so why this talk? So I was trying to write, when I was writing this talk, I was trying to think about what audience um, do I have in mind? And I'm thinking that it's like, so my audience, so the, the audience in my head is, you know, people who are interested in contributing to open source, you know, like they thought about it, they see a benefit to doing this at this point in their careers, but they don't necessarily know anybody who does it or who can give them sort of direct guidance. So that, so this is kind of what I'm going to talk about, because a lot of what I'm going to say is stuff that, you know, like if you know somebody who does it, they'll probably tell you a lot of the same things. Um, but so why? So people see the value in contributing to open source, right? I mean, you know, like you read about it in the news, it's, um, you know, you hear about it at work, you hear about it in, you know, like developer boot camps, all sorts of places. But you also hear all of these things about the open source community and what it's like. And that can make it hard to get started, especially for people who feel outside the, perser the, per the perceived norm of open source culture. You know, like if I think about what an open source developer looks like, I don't necessarily think of someone who looks like me, even though I am an open source developer. Um, and the other thing is that, well, open source culture is not especially organized. I mean, it's not a monolith, and so, you know, it's not transparent. And when things are not, tra and, you know, hard to be transparent when you're not organized, and when you're, you know, so it's hard for, hard for people to explain the rules or necessarily even to, like, tell what the rules are. And there are rules, I mean, or conventions. Um, so a couple of things. Um, before getting started in open source, things that I tend to suggest to people are um, think about identity and channels, like how do you want people, what are the mechanisms you want people to use when interacting with you around open source? Um, another one, and I'll talk about this in more detail, is consider whether a personal project is going to serve your needs better than contributing to somebody else's project. And then there's sort of the myth of open source community. Sorry, I'm used to giving very interactive talks, so I tend to take, I, it, it's a little bit weird to be like, like, wow, you're all staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so which is why I keep stopping and looking around, because of that sort of my any questions cue. Um, but okay, so online identity and channels. Um, so open source is kind of, so when you sign up to work on open source, you don't necessarily think of it, but you're actually signing yourself up for kind of being a very minor celebrity, in that there are going to be a lot of people in the community who know who you are, um, like not who you are, but like they're going to have opinions about your work that they're probably going to conflate with opinions about you, and they're going to want to tell you stuff. And you need to be able to manage your attention around this. Um, like, so like I have coworkers who get email to email addresses that they check like once every three months for open source work that they did five years ago for some other job. Um, you know, like I have coworkers who get spammed on Twitter when people don't like something that they said in a pull request or, um, you know, or who have an issue and they feel like they're not getting enough attention or whatever. And so, you know, it's really nice to be able to say, you know what, I'm really busy at work this week. I'm just not going to look at that email account. I'm not going to look at that Twitter account. I'm not going to do these things because, you know, I do not have the spoons to spend on that stuff right this minute. Um, and, you know, I don't really, so I obsess a lot about online identity and things like context switching and context collapse. 
I'm not suggesting that you should, but I think it's totally worth um, reading um, Violet Blue's The Smart Girl's Guide to Privacy, which was recommended to me by Jessica DeVita. And, you know, just spend five minutes thinking about, like, how do you want your, how do you know, like, how do you want to be around this? How do you want to manage your attention? How do you want to want um, to manage your inputs? All of the, all of that stuff like that. So personal projects. One of the things that people say to me about why they want to get involved in open source is that maybe they're changing careers or starting a career and they want to build up a profile of code that they can show to, um, you know, people doing interviews or, you know, for networking purposes or future employers. Um, open source isn't necessarily the best venue for that unless you have a lot of code in a project. Um, and the reason why is that it's a very collaborative process and so it's hard to talk to, it's hard to talk to any piece of code in there as being specifically yours unless it's a pretty big piece of code. Um, you know, so what you're really, you know, so if your goal is I want something that I can talk to in interviews, like totally consider doing a small personal project and pushing the code up to GitHub and, you know, standing up a site on Heroku or whatever just to show it off. Um, so it's a great way to showcase your own code skills, your own designs. Um, people like, you know, like as a person who interviews people, I like seeing stuff that people have done end to end um, for, you know, whatever that means. Like it might not be a website. Um, but, it, you know, it's a thing that where you can talk to and you can talk about your design decisions and things that, you know, you wanted to do differently or that you would do differently now, whatever, you know, knowing what you know now. Um, like th a thing I want to want to mention because I because I am an ops engineer and you know I know a lot of ops engineers and you know there are people who don't necessarily get a chance to open source a lot of the code that they write or have a lot of time to open source to you know to write something specially but you know what even small projects will work for this like I have had perfectly good conversations with people about a particularly nice dot bash profile you know a way to organize like their personal stuff and. You know, it's a hugely useful thing that, you know, like they can talk to, they feel good about it, they feel ready to show it off, and, um, you know, and I can ask them questions. Like, so, that, so that's kind of my advice. The myth of open source community. Um, so tech culture is incredibly weird about mixing social and versus professional kinds of behaviors. Um, some of this, I think, is due to the geek social fallacies. If you haven't ever taken a look at them, I highly recommend this. Um, but the thing that I just, but you know, so there are all sorts of weird things about, um, you know, if you work with somebody, you want them to be your friends. And if you, and so this, so this extends to open source where it's like, these people are my community, they're supposed to be my friends, they're supposed to support me in certain ways. Why is this happening? Is it something that I did? And what I would say to that is that co collaboration's not the same thing as community. Um, that, I mean, I think both are important, but I don't think you have to get both of them in exactly the same places. So um, I was talking to a, a friend of mine about this and, you know, he, about community, and he made the point that, you know, in his professional life that he feels like he's found a lot of opportunities for collaboration, some friendships, but, you know, not so much community because he thinks of community as consisting of Recipro reciprocal care, you know, like, you know, you all take care of each other. Um, shared memory that it's like you can all say, oh, right, you know, yes, we talked about this before, and, you know, nobody has to feel bad about it, it's just a reminder. Um, and sort of a lasting kind of social organization. Like, these are things that, like, I think a lot of people do go into open source and they find these things and they're like, these are my people. Um, I was not one of those people. I don't think there's anything wrong with not being one of those people and, you know, you shouldn't worry about it. I mean, like, if you want it, you want it, but, you know, don't necessarily expect to find it within the confines of open source. So the other thing that people like to ask me a lot is, so I want to do open source, how do I pick a project? Like, how do I know whether a project is worth contributing to? Um, and, you know, it makes sense because it's like, it's an investment in time. I mean, it's an investment in, you know, some part of your professional self. You know, you want to know that the thing that you're doing is going to be rewarding. Um, and my answer is, well, you know, you do volunteer work, right? I mean, how did you choose that? Like, how did you decide to work with, you know, homeless people or transgender youth or, 
arts organizations or environmental causes. And it's like, well, so some of this is, are you interested in it? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but also, is work available that you want to do, right? I mean, for a particular organization. How does their schedule and time commitments mesh with yours? Um, can you feel productive? Like, this is a huge one for me, right? I mean, we've all had the experience of doing volunteer work where it's like, <coughs> I hope that helped, but you know I don't really feel like I got anything out of it, and you know that's not fun. Um, and you know what are the people like? So, and I will talk about all of these in more detail. All right. So this is I love this slide because I spent three years doing very badly in graduate school learning this. Um, so I'm giving you this advice for free so that you don't have to do that. Um, so just because something is a really interesting topic does not mean that it's fun to work on or that it's fun for you to work on. Um, like a lot of times people will say to me, you know, I'm really interested in databases and maybe Postgres is a good start for me. And it's like, well, maybe. I mean, Postgres is an awesome community that does a lot to help um, new contributors and all kinds of beginners, but just because you're interested in databases doesn't, it, you know, that might not translate to being interested in the internals of how a database is implemented. So, um, you know, like if you run into something like that, you know, if you're like, well, you know, like I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying if you do it and you find out that eh, maybe not so much because like the C++ thing is so not me, you know, don't feel bad about it. Move on. Um, interesting topics. They often require specialized skills and knowledge, and this has a time cost. Um, again, I'm not saying that I think that Zookeeper would be a terrible way to bootstrap yourself on distributed systems, but you know, adjust your expectations accordingly. Know that you're going to have some amount of ramp up time. And I'd say it's really critical to look for projects of work where you can make progress. Um, I think that's really important so that you get that little, po that little positive feedback loop going and you know, it's a thing that you want to keep doing, it's a thing that you want to keep making time for in your life. Um, you know, I think that's really important. So seeking interesting open source software work. Um, a thing that people often do not think to do is to check out a particular project's issues or bug track for work that looks interesting. So a lot of projects now are trying to organize themselves so that they tag issues up front as, you know, jump in or getting started or whatever. And these are intended to be for people who are new to a project and are thinking about contributing. Um, so, you know, it's worth looking, it's worth, you know, it's a sign if a project has tags like this even, and it's a good way to find out, like, is this a good, is this a good place to get started, for me to get started. Um, it's important to look for projects that can use your skills and knowledge. And I say this as an ops person who has a lot of experience in the, in the chef ecosystem. There are a lot of weird operating systems out there. Anything that is a non-Linux can count as weird. Like if you have access to you know, switch hardware, you work on a BSD, you work on these things. Like these are all really good venues for um, participation because you know, people need, stuff, need, you know, need to make their stuff work on that and they might not know how. So doing a port isn't the worst thing you can do. Um, look for work that isn't being done that you don't mind trying to do, right? I mean, like I know people who bootstrap themselves on open source by just going in and writing tests for projects that are like, yeah, you know, we're not, we're not where we should be with tests. You know, we don't know if we're going to have time, but you know, like if you're willing to invest some time learning their test framework, it's a good way to get started. And my thing is absolutely do not do work you don't want to do. Like I think there's a difference between, um, the, you know, like you shouldn't do things that you don't think are fun. There's sort of a difference. I, you know, I will caveat that by saying that I think it's important to follow the development processes of the project, whatever they are. So, you know, do not be the jerk that refuses to write tests because you just don't want to do that. You know, if the if the project is like, no, we want tests. Um, but you know, really, you should, this is supposed to be optional, right? This is supposed to be work that you do on the side, and you know, don't do it if you don't want to do it. Um, people are always saying things like, you know, you should totally get started by fixing the documentation or fixing typos. Um, this turns out to be not as easy as you would think um, <laughs> because for two reasons. One of them is that documentation that is in a pretty straightforward format like markdown or text, that's probably pretty straightforward for you to fix if you see like something obviously wrong. Documentation that's generated out of a framework 
um, where there's a lot of templating, where there's a lot of um, there's a lot of abstraction, that's a lot harder to break into, and so it's kind of less rewarding as as a contribution for some people. I mean, might not be for you, but it is for some people, and they just get discouraged. Um, typos are sort of controversial because some projects really care that you don't just come along and fix a typo. Like, you know, they want their typos fixed, they just want them fixed as part of something else. And, you know, this is a thing where you can look at the history of contributions and see, like, what have they accepted? What have they not accepted? Um, so that's the thing. Some new code changes are really hard to get through as a new contributor. Um, like, I see this a lot with design features. Like, I will show some UI to a designer friend, and they will look at me and like, and there's so many ways that this could be so much better. Like, this is just, no. And, and I'm like, oh, God, I wish you could fix this, but it's so hard to fix it without having a history with that project. Um, you know, because, like, people, it's, you know, design is a thing that people react to. And there, there's, you know, some projects would be like, yes, awesome. And other projects might be like, who are you and why are you talking to us again? So you know, just know that this can be a thing. Um, and the other thing is be very careful about taking on emotional work. Um, this, there are every project, well, you know, there will be some fight that really boils down to personalities. And especially as a new contributor, you do not want to get involved in that. Like, do not do this, do not go there, do not pass go, do not, you know, just keep, keep moving along it's, because it's, it's a no-win situation. I mean, kind of the open secret of open source, which everybody knows, but it's, people don't tend to articulate, is it's about, it tends to be, the community is made up of people who want to write code. I mean, like, that's the core. And not in the sense of being important. It's, an, it's, um, it's core in the sense of, you know, these are the numbers. These are, these are who started things. And the things that get done well in open source are the things that get done that people who write code like to do and want to do. Other stuff, it kind of falls off the, the end of the universe. This is not true of all open source projects. Um, like, there are some really notable exceptions, like Seth Vargo, who is a former coworker, Fletcher Nickel, who's a coworker now, um, Jordan Sissel, who's just somebody whose projects I've used. Like, these are all people who really care deeply about making the entire experience of interacting with their project good, not just the parts that you know people use. Um, there are lots of people like that, but you know there are a lot of projects that do not operate on those terms and you know, set your expectations. Scheduling and time commitments. Avoid overcommitting. It's really easy to overcommit in open source. It, it, it totally is. Just you know, avoid committing too much time to it. Um, just be careful. Um, follow project conventions for claiming work. These are a little bit weird, and they're not always well explained. But you know, people do different things to say, yes, I'm working on this. Nobody else needs to work on it, or if they're working on it, talk to me. Um, whatever they are, follow them. Find out what they are. Um, if you're a person who cares deeply about synchronous events, like face-to-face -face things, um, like is this a project where you can make any of those? Like, you know, can you make their video chats, or their meetups, or their hangouts, or their in-person bug bashes? Because, um, you know, it's not fun to feel left out. And if, this, and if you know going in that this is a no-op for you, you know, that's a thing. You might want to make a different choice. So my sidebar here is, how does anybody find the time? Which is a question that everybody who works in open source gets asked. And the answer is, for a lot of us, it's, the, it's our day job, right? I mean, we work for open source companies like Chef or Basho, Elasticsearch, um, where you know, it's a company that has a core product with a substantial open source component. We work for companies that are friendly to open source. Um, Nordstrom is a great local example of a company that has, you know, they have a lot of things that are not open source, but you know, they have a lot of things that are, and where they do, they, where they can, they try to contribute back. And there are also people who work for um, open source nonprofits, like the Linux Foundation, where they explicitly get paid to work on certain things. Um, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is that it's really easy to say, oh my gosh, this other person is so productive, and what have I done you know, in my two hours? And it's like, it, you know, it's worth keeping in mind that that other person may be somebody who has a lot of job support for their open source work. And that you know you should not feel bad, you should not um, compare you know their work to yours, you know in a negative way because it's because you know you don't know what the circumstances of their work are necessarily. So will this project make me feel productive? This is huge for me. 
Um, so for me, like how organized or predictable are they? I have seen a lot of people try to contribute to open source and they get all excited and they do their first PR. Um, and then it sits for six months and then somebody's like, oh, um, well you fix these like five things and rebase it against master and then we might accept it. Like that's depressing, um, <laughs> right? I mean, it totally happens, but it's depressing. So, you know, don't, you know, like, you know, like, and people get upset about this and, you know, they're entirely justified. And this was not the first time that that project did that to someone and all of that is in the history. So, you know, if you know going in that this is a thing that you care about, then, you know, take a look at a project's history, you know, like read their issues and their, and their code submissions and their PRs and their mailing list and see, like, you know, do you think that this is a thing that you can work with? Um, and, you know, can you work with how they work? There's this old Linux joke about bike sheds, about a group of people getting together to, pick, to decide what color to paint a bike shed, and the discussion goes on and on and on. Um, there are a lot of them in open source, like coding style is a huge one, how you manage commits is another. If you know that these are things that bother you going in, and you look at a project and you do things the other way, do not work for that project. <laughs> because there is no, there's no compromise available, right? Nobody ever says, well, you want to do four space and dense, and I want to do two space and dense, so let's try three. Like, this is not a thing that happens, <laughs> right? Like, like, somebody, like, you're just going to have to suck it up and do it their way. And, you know, as the newcomer, at least for a while. And if that's going to bother you, don't do it. And what are the people like? Do you like how people treat each other? You know, are there people there who you see as being like you in whatever way you consider valuable? Um, because, you know, that matters. It's really isolate, you know, like, I've worked on plenty of open source projects where I am the only woman. And, you know, there's sometimes there's just this little bit of sinking feeling where it's like, okay, I'm going to have to explain again that, you know, I'm not going to take out the emotional garbage for them or whatever it is. And, you know, like, like do you want to be the person who breaks them in? And codes of conduct, community guidelines, you know, all of these are things that determine that, I mean, they're, they're signals for how much is this a, a project that pays attention to its community, you know, like do their values look like mine? That, you know, so look for things like that. So that all sounds like a lot of work. Like I got, through, got to the slide and I was like, oh God, I've just made it sound so depressing. So I thought I'd close by reminding us all about the benefits of working on open source. So it's an awesome way to give back and help others. Like I feel really good when I merge a PR and people are like, yes, thank you, you fixed this thing that's been bugging me for months. Um, it's a really good opportunity for professional development and networking. So, you know, people get jobs through their open source work. People make contacts through their open source work. You know, these are all things that it's totally worth, um, totally worth your time. And it's a really awesome way to diversify the conversations you have with people around technology. You know, like in work, we tend to get very focused on the day-to-day -day and on the, okay, what do we have to do to meet this next deadline? And this is a way to open the spread of that conversation a little bit. So that's it. Thank you for your time. Um, if you have questions, you can catch me in person. I'll be around all day or um, hit me up on Twitter. Thank you so much.